everyone and welcome back to always watching today we're discussing pashinko season 2 episode 2 death at the start of a new journey we are now going from a storyline of survival to one of fighting back i absolutely love the transitions this episode both storylines end in death but in slightly different ways i also love the aesthetic both storylines start in the dark sanja and her family have spent years and years praying for isaac's return and now they are preparing for his death. Meanwhile, Solomon has become the shame of a nation and he is just hiding out. He doesn't know what to do with himself. And by the end of both stories, they have this fire reignited inside of them and they are ready to fight back. The episode starts off with death slowly creeping up on Sanja and her family. We see that the war is imminent. Members of the community have started to receive notifications of their loved one's deaths. And it, at this point, Sanja and her family have to decide what they're going to do next because their time is very limited. Sanja's husband also returns thanks to Kosan. And it's very clear that Kosan could have gotten him out a lot sooner, but he was hoping that his absence would draw Sanja closer to him. I really love the contrast between the conversations Isaac was having with his sons and those Solomon was having with Hamani. Both Isaac and Solomon feel very abandoned and betrayed. Isaac in particular was stabbed in the back by someone he felt very close to. Granted, he, also, he always suspected that this individual didn't like him very much, but he gravely underestimated him. And to make matters worse, this was someone that his family also trusted and watching your loved one do their best and try to live a good life and still be betrayed. It really makes you question if there's any humanity left in the world. And that's exactly what Noya is going through. Noya has done his best to keep it together and he is just in shambles because he was also blindsided. If his father was betrayed, this was not the person he would have seen coming he would not have seen this coming from miles away both solomon and isaac have spent their life trying to do the right thing doing everything in the right way and what did that get them and noya is watching this and wondering like is this really a path i want to follow do i really want to be like isaac because it seems like nice guys finish last and they are in such a predicament because how do you fit in let alone thrive in an environment that you feel like you will never ever belong in. And maybe one solution to that is to be an individual that can thrive in multiple spaces. We see that Noya is trying to learn English and in the first episode he was caught reading The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. And maybe if you're able to kind of branch out and think outside of your world, you don't have to be dependent on those who despise you to survive. And that's exactly what Solomon has done his whole life, but all of it ha has come crashing down. And this conversation that Solomon has with the Japanese businessman was really fantastic. He comes to him hat in hand and literally begs for money. He tells him, listen, I messed up. You made your point. Please unblacklist me. This Japanese man at first, it does seem like he's sympathetic towards him. He draws many commonalities between them, basically saying, listen, I also came from nothing and I also had to really fight hard to get to where I want. But ultimately, I am using you as an example to show everyone what happens when you mess with me. And the way that this businessman was talking to Solomon, you can tell that this goes beyond just a business dealing. He wants to end Solomon's ability to thrive in this country period. Like he doesn't even like that someone like Solomon exists, someone that can thrive in multiple spaces and move easily. And doesn't really need to be dependent on people like him for food and water. And I think that's what really was irking him. It really felt like this Japanese businessman was trying to clip his wings all together. And Solomon definitely clocked that. And after that conversation, Solomon is just in misery. He's in pain. He goes back to where it all began. He goes to Hamani's house. And I really loved how he confessed to her. He tells her, listen, I have been trying to get you out of this house for some time now. I have used a lot of questionable methods to do it, and I'm sorry. And I really like that he didn't take the lesson that the Japanese businessman had shown him. Like Solomon recognizes that a lot of what's being done to him, he was doing to others. And at this point, he's tired of doing it. And what's worse is he's been kind of doing all these things and it hasn't really gotten him anywhere. And Hamani's reaction is really telling because at first she's totally disgusted by him. She can't believe what she's hearing. 
And then she's like, okay, at least you figured it out finally. Better late than never. And for his honesty, he is rewarded with a light at the end of this very dark tunnel. We find out that the reason Hamani is able to afford this house is that there may be corpses buried underneath it. And if anyone ever found out, this property would go from being one of the most coveted pieces of property in the country to worth absolutely nothing. And suddenly Solomon is reignited, he's excited, and he can't wait to burn everything down. But Hamani is not really is not really accepting Solomon's plan, and rightfully so. She has spent her whole life being exploited. And you have to worry about, again, this outside world trying to take advantage of you. And the last thing you need to worry about is your own people trying to exploit you for gain. And this idea of exploitation is also seen in the first storyline. Like the pastor is betrayed by someone who he thought he was close friends with. And the reason he betrayed him is because he was jealous and he wanted his position. So again, it's like you got to worry about all these people inside of you. And on top of that, you got to worry about people in your own house. And how many is like, listen, why must we disturb the dead? And Solomon is a very clever guy. He basically tries to reframe it and says, listen, there's nothing I can do about the past. I'm not responsible for it. But what I can do is make sure that history never repeats itself. And listening to Solomon recount his life, like it took him until rock bottom to really contemplate and really appreciate his own privilege. His parents, his grandmother has had to fight for him to even be able to exist. He has never known starvation. He has never wanted for anything. Like he has lived, as he has said, a pathetically easy life. And this ease has really blinded him and allowed him to separate his parents' trauma, his grandmother's trauma from his. He's now starting to realize how it's all connected. And as much as he's not responsible for the past, it still affects him. It's still something that he has to make right because as, as hard as he tries to assimilate and run away from it and it does follow him and I think it's so important to know where you come from because even if you might not be aware of it where you come from and your your history like the history that you're born into it does very much affect how other people see you how other people treat you and the more awareness you have of your own history and your own background the more able you are to spot how this history is affecting your progress and your success and ultimately your ability to thrive and do better for yourself. I love the last shot of Solomon. He walks into this conference room in broad daylight, super confident, lays out his entire evil plan and basically says, listen, no mercy. We are taking that man down. Like basically he's like that, like we are preparing for his funeral. Not only does he want to bury him and put him in the ground, he wants everyone to know that he's the person responsible. I think his confidence, the way that the episode ended with him in the light, like this is not a man that's hiding or bowing his head anymore. Like, and this goes beyond a business deal because what Solomon is really bothered by is the idea that people can look at him and see him as a liability. He's like, listen, you want to see me as a liability? I'll show you I'll show you what liability means. I'll, like, I'll show you the meaning of the word. Meanwhile, in the first storyline, again, I love the ending of this episode. It ends with Isaac's funeral. I think Isaac's death really ignites something in Sanja. Before he dies, she promises him that their children will not only survive, but thrive. And she will do everything in her power to make sure that his dreams become a reality. And I love the last shot of this episode like this burning coffin because this fire is very symbolic of what's happening inside them like they are done enduring they want to live they want to fight for a future that's better than what they're currently going through now i love the the sound of like gunfire and bombs because yes they're going into war but it's also not just a war for territory it's a spiritual war it's a cultural war and it's a war that they are destined to win so you guys let me know what you think and until next time